So I'm very pleased to introduce you Hannes Gusserhassan, which is a very old friend of New Direction. He supported our work for now many years, I have to say. And recently, I have to say that we published his best work that he did for New Direction, a book on uh, 24 thinkers' conservative liberal tradition uh, in two tomes. Um, Hannes Gisarsson is a professor of political science in Iceland, but also I know that he was quite involved in politics and advising politicians in his country. And um, he will now give us his first lecture of the week, as you will have a second lecture on Friday. I give you the voice. <coughs> Thank you very much. I am uh, pleased to uh, be here and uh, be able to give a talk. What I'm going to do is to give an informal talk now and uh, reserve my lecture to uh, later, where I will be discussing my, uh, my book in two volumes about the uh, 24 conservative liberal thinkers. What I thought might be the most Im interesting uh, contribution of mine now would be to offer some comments on the two uh, speakers that uh, were here today. Um, Pedro Sorts and uh, uh, Francisco José Contreras. Uh, unfortunately, they are not with us now, so they can't uh, exchange their views with me. But uh, that shouldn't be much of a problem because uh, in many ways I agree with them and uh, where the di disagreements are. They are not uh, in any way uh, terribly important. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I suppose uh, you, you, you guys were able to uh, follow me. So now I will uh, start my talk about uh, the two uh, contributions today. Uh, what you have gathered from both of them, both from uh, Pedro Schwartz and uh, Francisco José Contreras is that uh, there are many liberalisms and I do agree with uh, Professor Contreras that uh, uh, there is a, a kind of conservatism which is not liberal, and there is a kind of liberalism which is not conservative and indeed quite hostile to uh, conservatism. Uh, I also think that um, uh, Pedro Schwartz's uh, uh, critique of uh, two kinds of liberalism are well taken. First, romantic uh, uh, liberalism, which is basically uh, an applause of uh, self-expression. Uh, the individual who chooses him or herself. This is not a realistic picture of society where we act under a lot of constraints and where we have to operate under the liberty of the law and uh, good public order. Uh, and uh, Pedro Schwartz also made a telling critique, a cutting critique of rationalistic uh, liberalism, Kantian liberalism, where liberalism flows from uh, a, a conception of, of, of reason. What uh, Schwartz uh, pointed out, uh, I think correctly, is that uh, liberalism is co incomplete. Um, I would, however, and it would have been very interesting to have a discussion with Perl Schwartz on this, have uh, taken exception to one thing that he takes from Hayek. Uh, Hayek was my intellectual mentor. I did my doctoral thesis at Oxford University in 1985 about Hayek, and I wrote precisely about conservative liberalism in Hayek. And uh, then I didn't realize it, but I have learned it now, that um, uh, Hayek makes a distinction between the good Anglo-Saxon liberalism and the bad continental liberalism, which is over-rationalistic in his opinion. And he does that in the uh, paper that uh, Pedro Schwartz uh, uh, quoted, uh, which is a, uh, an extremely interesting uh, piece, uh, um, Individualism True and False, and I recommend uh, reading it. It's one of the best uh, articles by Hayek. But I don't think Hayek is quite right. What I discovered when I was uh, working on this book of mine was that uh, even if uh, the, uh, the three uh, founders of uh, liberalism, namely John Locke and David Hume and Adam Smith, they had a, a rich perception of society. Uh, the utilitarians of the 19th century did not, like John Stuart Mill and Bentham. 
and uh, the work, I believe, of uh, <coughs> John Locke, Adam Smith and David Hume was carried further and continued and developed and de improved upon by French liberalism of the 19th century. Uh, Benjamin Constant and Frederick Bastiat and Alice de Tocqueville presented, in my opinion, a much more convincing case for the liberal order than uh, the utilitarian state. Uh, so I, I think that this distinction that Hayek makes uh, is not uh, terribly well uh, conceived. And uh, one reason for it is that Hayek was extremely sympathetic to the Anglo-Saxon political tradition. So am I, obviously, I spent four years in England uh, writing my dissertation, and I am very sympathetic to the British, but they haven't uh, said the final truth <laughs> about uh, politics, and I, I will actually return to that theme uh, a bit later. So this is uh, one uh, thing that where I would um, uh, criticize uh, uh, Pedro Schwartz, uh, even if um, I think his uh, talk was very well uh, taken. And uh, where he says that the being a liberal is not enough, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and his uh, contrast between what is right and what is good, what uh, pertains to society and what pertains to the individual, this is a, a well-known distinction and uh, very well uh, taken uh, too. I also uh, do agree with uh, him and against Rousseau that society civilizes us. Uh, it is not that man is uh, born good and becomes bad in society. It's much more that man is born a savage, an animal, and he be be becomes good I I in society by the civilizing forces of uh, nature. And that is the uh, great truth in uh, the uh, um, doctrine of original sin, that man is, by nature, an ignorant, fallible, uh, 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 being and if unconstrained, uh, we will uh, invite uh, evil into our lives. In fact, uh, I once had a very interesting conversation with a Polish philosopher, uh, Leszek Kolakowski. I was a, st a philosophy student at the University of Iceland then. It was before I went uh, to Oxford. And... Uh, I asked Leszek Kolokowski, isn't really the source of our problems that God is dead in the minds of men? And Kolokowski replied, no, the real uh, problem is that the devil is dead. By which he meant that we have lost uh, our conception of the possibility of evil. Because it's such a long time since uh, the Second World War, National Socialism, and uh, the evil deeds of communism haven't quite penetrated our minds in the West. So uh, we should be more aware of evil and also the possibilities of disaster and catastrophes. We, we are in the midst of, or actually I hope that uh, we are seeing one ending now, the pandemic. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we have to keep all, all this in mind. We can't take for granted the good life that we have uh, been living in, in the West. Uh, there is a, uh, another point uh, well made by Pedro Schwartz, uh, uh, who is of course a very eloquent uh, man and speaks uh, <coughs> very well. It is uh, what the German scholars of the 19th century used to call Das Adam Smith problem. And this is the following, and uh, this was well um, explained by uh, Pedro Schwartz. In uh, the theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith uh, bases his argument on sympathy. He is, tries to explain why we basically behave uh, rather well. And he believes that inside us there is this little man, the impartial spectator, that tells us now you have to behave well, uh, you have to uh, seek honor and dignity. Uh, but in the world of nations, uh, Adam Smith bases his argument on, on self-interest, not on sympathy. Now, are those two values in conflict? And uh, the solution to the Das Adam Smith problem is, of course, that those two uh, refer to different spheres of life. 
uh, we uh, love our neighbors and we love our family and uh, we feel sympathy to them and uh, then we have a weaker feeling but also a sense of sympathy to, to the whole of mankind. But when we are actually in, in the marketplace, uh, then we are hackling for, for the best prices. And that's a different sphere. Uh, so we have different moral uh, rules uh, in those two spheres. One in the vicinity and the neighborhood and in our immediate family. Uh, and then uh, another one in the abstract uh, great society uh, where we try to get the best prices we can in Iceland for our fish and you in Spain for your wines and the Japanese for their cars. So uh, uh, <coughs> we have to bear this in, in mind that uh, <coughs> love is limited by our, um, by our uh, mind. Uh, in fact, there's a number, 150, the so-called uh, Dunbar number. We can't really take in or, or rationalize with more than 150 people, but that's uh, more than most animal can, uh, animals can anyway. So, um, we uh, can combine a theory, and that's what Pedro Schwartz uh, pointed out to us, which uh, is based both on self-interest, which applies in our market transactions, and sympathy, which applies to uh, our relationships uh, with uh, people that we know and care about, and in a vague sense of, uh, about everybody. Uh, and uh, then uh, one thing that, where I did agree with him, and it cannot be emphasized uh, enough, I believe, is uh, there is a fundamental fact of our society. It is diversity, that people are different. And uh, this is captured, of course, uh, in <coughs> the adage, uh, different strokes for different folks. We... we uh, the, 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 the problem, for example, with EU and with um, centralization is that one uh, size of shoes doesn't fit all. People are different. They have different uh, projects in life. And uh, what we have to do is to ensure that they can um, uh, pursue their projects if they're not harmful for other people. Uh, <clears throat> I would also like to... Uh, I can't resist, uh, even if it's anecdotal, to uh, uh, mention... Uh, he. he um, Pedro Sorts said he wasn't really all that um, um, much in favor of uh, Winston Churchill's political opinions, even if Winston Churchill was the leader of the free world and saved uh, us twice, first from Nazism and then from communism, or was one of the leaders in this and saw all this clearer than anyone else. It was, uh, that's granted. But I think also Winston Churchill was a conservative liberal, um, like Margaret Thatcher after him, and... Uh, Winston Churchill, in fact, wrote, uh, read uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom in, uh, when it came out in 1944. And shortly afterwards, he met Hayek at a social function. And he told Hayek that the book was good that, that, and, uh, and that he agreed with it completely. But then he added, but this will not happen here in England. And I don't think he is absolutely right there. Uh, and... Um, uh, you remember that Orwell's uh, dystopia, 1984, is basically taking Soviet totalitarianism, Stalinism, and uh, planting it on the English soil, and that makes the uh, novel so striking. Uh, of course, uh, fascism could uh, take place in England as in other countries, even if the liberal tradition is quite uh, strong in, in England. I think Churchill was wrong there and Hayek uh, was right that uh, Rota Serfden can be taken in all kinds of societies and uh, there are all kinds of dangers. Uh, Pedro Schwartz also, uh, also uh, mentioned Amartya Sen. He was one of my teachers at Oxford and once when he was uh, attacking Ronald Reagan, uh, and um, his um, carelessness about uh, poverty, I raised my hand in, um, uh, there and said, but isn't it really so that uh, the United States provides the greatest opportunity uh, of any country in the world for people to uh, leave poverty, to escape poverty and uh, become prosperous? And Sen said, oh, aha, you are one of the people who believe in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And then there was a little laughter, but he didn't really uh, reply to my challenge. 
which is that the United States, uh, and uh, I, I agree actually with Professor Contreras about the founding fathers and, 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 uh, and so on, the United States pro provided the greatest opportunity uh, the world has seen for all the millions of people who came destitute uh, there, uh, there too from Europe to uh, work themselves and produce themselves into, uh, in, into prosperity. Uh, American capitalism was the best machine that has ever been invented to produce prosperity, to leave poverty. And the good news, of course, is now, as uh, both our previous speakers pointed out, that the poverty has been greatly declining in the West in the last um, 20 to 30 years, more rapidly than we've seen in any other time in, in history. And this is, of course, because we've availed ourselves of the division of labor and free trade. One, uh, I told you that I would take issue with one thing that Pedro Schwartz says, which is uh, Hayek's distinction between the good Anglo-Saxon uh, liberal tradition and the bad continental uh, tradition. Another uh, issue where I don't think I would agree co totally with him, and not either with my uh, mentors that I admired greatly, Karl Popper and uh, Friedrich Hayek, is about nationalism. I think actually there is a kind of nationalism which is perfectly cogent and can be compatible with uh, uh, conservative liberalism as I understand the, the, the subject. Uh, it is the uh, nationalism of the little countries of, of Europe, like my own country, Iceland. Why, why did we uh, see the, the uh, ties with Denmark? Because we were Icelanders, not Danes. Therefore, we uh, had our sovereignty recognized in 1918. The Finns, they left uh, Russia. They used the first opportunity in December 1917 to leave uh, the Russian Empire. Why? Because they were Finns. They were not, not Russians. They thought of themselves in a different way from the Russians. Uh, uh, the Norwegians, they seceded from Sweden in uh, 1905. Why? Because they were Norwegians, not, not Swedes. So, uh, building a state um, to reaffirm your uh, national identity is not, in my opinion, an evil project at all. Uh, and I think, actually, uh, much can be said for it. Uh, uh, if you do not have a state, uh, it's quite um, possible that uh, you will lose your identity. Take the Ingrians uh, who live, actually, and nobody has heard of them. They live in uh, the region between Finland and Estonia, and they speak a language which is very similar both to Finnish and Estonian, and all these three languages are mutually intelligible. They have more or less disappeared uh, from the world because they do not have a state to defend their interests, to keep up their language, to maintain their traditions. The same uh, uh, happens with the Kurds who are embattled in the mountains uh, of Iraq and Iran and so on. So I believe that this is not a bad project, but of course, nationalism has been abused by demagogues, uh, jingoists, and so on. So uh, we can make a distinction between uh, cultural, non-aggressive uh, nationalism of the small nations that want to reaffirm their identities and the bad militant nationalism and... Um, I think this was perhaps not uh, very clearly expressed in, uh, in uh, Pedro Sort's uh, talk. So uh, I, I have been toying with the idea of writing a book called In Defense of National Liberalism, uh, which was basically also prevalent in Europe in the 19th century. Then um, I would um, like to say a few words. I don't want to give a very long talk here because everybody is itching, of course, to go out in the good weather and see this very interesting place. Um, Professor Contreras, he, he quoted Scruton. I, uh, when I was doing my thesis at Oxford, I, I read Scruton carefully, and uh, I have had the uh, opportunity to meet him, actually, at the uh, functions of New Direction and and ECR, uh, and for which, uh, which I appreciated very much, and we had uh, talks, and I, enjoy, I enjoyed it very much. And he, he really brought us on being, if not uh, is, a, a genius, or was. Unfortunately, he has passed away. Um, but I, um, 
I criticized him in my dissertation, and uh, I don't think that my criticism applies as well uh, nowadays, because uh, actually Scruton moved. Uh, in his first edition of his books on conservatism, he was uh, much more critical of the free market than he was in the later editions. And why was that? Because he being a very profound thinker, he realized that conservative values require the free market. It is government and bureaucracy that is uh, the greatest threat to conservative values, like the family and property and civil society. Uh, those values thrive best in uh, the free and spontaneous order uh, that we ens envisage. And that is the reason I believe that liberals and conservatives can be allies rather than um, uh, opponents. I, um, I once participated uh, in a discussion at a conference with uh, two eminent uh, scholars, uh, my supervisor at Oxford, John Gray, and uh, Professor Kenneth Minog of the London School of Economics about conservatism and liberalism. And uh, they were, uh, both of them, liberal conservatives, whereas I was a conservative liberal. What does this mean? This means for, that for them, uh, they basically uh, conceived of themselves, like Scruton did, as defenders of the British political tradition. They were British, therefore they were liberals, and therefore they were uh, um, conservatives. So, but I, um, I approached the, uh, all this from a different angle, uh, being more a liberal who, uh, who also thinks that uh, con uh, conservative sentiments have to supplement and complement the classical liberal principles of free trade and private property. And uh, in this talk that I gave, and I repeat the argument uh, in my book, I said that I could identify, and uh, I was thinking about that when I was listening to Professor Contreras, I could identify two uh, values uh, where I would differ from real, genuine conservatives, not merely conservative liberals, but real, hardcore conservatives. These two values, and it would be interesting to hear uh, people's responses on, on, on this, those, those two values or principles are progress and universalism. I, as a free market liberal, believe in the possibility of progress. I realize very well that history is not a train going uh, to an end station called liberty. Uh, history is rather like a drunken spider that... Uh, goes around uh, the, the web and doesn't quite know where it is going next. That's quite true. Uh, but there is a possibility of progress. We have seen it, uh, uh, like uh, it was actually mentioned, that child mortality has uh, gone down uh, dramatically. Uh, many diseases have been, uh, have been made outlawed, more or less. Uh, poverty has declined. And all this is progress. Uh, we may have regress as, uh, as, as well, like, like we had in, uh, with National Socialism and Communism in Russia and Germany in the 20th century, but there is definitely a possibility of progress. This is the first of the two values where conservatives and uh, conservative liberals like I may differ. The other thing is universalism. Uh, and there I actually would uh, say that Christianity plays a role because uh, both Christianity and uh, uh, conservative liberalism mean, in my opinion, and it may be my interpretation, personal interpretation, uh, the, the extension of the moral vision to the whole of mankind. I think that the most important uh, message of Jesus Christ was that everybody was equal before God, rich and poor, man and woman, uh, black and white. And this is also the case uh, with uh, the free market. In the free market, um, you know, everybody is supposed to, to be equal and uh, you are not interested in the color of the skin of your baker, but rather in the quality of his bread and the price, of course, uh, of, of the bread. So um, 
uh, universalism, recognizing everybody, uh, all nations, and also thinking that freedom is not, should not be confined to the British Isles, and <laughs> to uh, North America. And uh, this is something that both Scruton and uh, John Gray and uh, Kenneth Minogue, who, who was a New Zealander, uh, they, uh, all of them sort of thought that uh, freedom was not something that could be exported to uh, alien shores. But I think freedom is a condition fit for the whole of mankind, even if I recognize that uh, behind it in the Anglo-Saxon countries there is a practice of many centuries of mutual uh, adjustments. And I think that uh, freedom is based on this uh, universitas hominum, uh, that the Catholic Church espoused in the Middle Ages. That brings me to um, a question which was um, uh, put uh, by Robert Tyler here in the discussion, uh, <coughs> Pedro Schwartz's uh, discussion. It was Ayn Rand and self-interest and um, uh, selfishness. In my book, uh, I have a chapter on Ayn Rand, and I actually try to reinterpret her. Uh, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, what does it really tell you? Because uh, you, you all remember that uh, Christ uh, replies uh, when he is asked, how are we to behave, with the parable. First, the traveler, he uh, was the victim of um, bandits on the road. This teaches us that we need uh, a government, law and order, to protect us from bandits. So we need uh, what uh, socialists try to dismiss as the night watchman state. This is one uh, lesson we can learn from the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Another one which is very interesting is that both the priest and the Levite passed by, didn't help him, the intellectuals of the day. Uh, the third thing which uh, we have to bear in mind is uh, that the good Samaritan had sufficient money to help the man. This is an argument to having, for having people who are rich, like Pedro Schwartz said, to, who contribute to... Uh, mm, to institutes like uh, New Direction and Fundación uh, uh, Civismo, uh, uh, which add to the variety of opinions so that we do not have this uh, uh, totally one-sided discussion that we have in universities. I think I am the only person in my faculty who is not left-wing in the faculty of, uh, of um, human uh, of social sciences at the University of Iceland. There are perhaps a few others, but they are, uh, as they say, um, in, 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 in the closet. Um, then a fourth uh, lesson from um, the um, uh, parable of the good Samaritan, uh, Samaritan is, he did good with his own money, not with the money of other people. And this brings me to what my uh, good friend Milton Friedman said should be called the 11th commandment. It is, thou shalt not do good with other people's money. And if you look at the left, uh, they are endlessly good and generous. But if you look a little bit further and closer, then you see that they are always good for other people's money. And it is the easiest thing in the world to do so. Now this brings me to uh, Ayn uh, Rand, because I believe that the, the, uh, the highwaymen, the robbers, they are like the states are today, but the good Samaritan, he is a, uh, he is a Randian character. He is somebody who is prosperous, who can do something uh, with his own money. And I think also that um, there is a paradox in uh, Rand's uh, novels that Pedro Schwartz sort of touched upon, which is that uh, the great heroes of the novels, and I recommend you reading them, they are quite, um, they are like taking a cold shower. Um, uh, the heroes in the Randian novels, uh, they, are, they are not really motivated by greed. 
they are expressing themselves, they're pursuing their projects. They are not letting money or the masses control them. They are heroes. They are like the Good Samaritan. So I think that uh, self-expression and self-interest need not be in conflict with Christian values if both are properly interpreted. And I, I think that this may be uh, a minority, minority view. So my conclusion is uh, that uh, there is uh, some conservatism, which is not liberal. There is some uh, liberalism, which is not conservative. But there is, as Professor Contreras uh, pointed out correctly, a conservative liberalism, uh, which uh, applauds the great achievements of uh, our civilization, but tries to, um, tries to um, conduct um, politics in the name of stability and, and continuity. And uh, my, final, uh, <coughs> my final thought is that uh, often it was necessary, but now it is uh, indispensable for liberals and conservatives to work together because our Western civilization is threatened uh, from the inside. Despite all the enormous achievements of the West, uh, we have to defend it now more strongly than uh, ever before. The devil is not dead, and we have to contain him, and uh, we, have to, uh, we have to reintroduce, uh, I believe, the concept of universitas hominum, liberty under the law, uh, defense of Western civilization. Thank you. So are there any questions now? Um, yeah, I have a question about nationalism that you have expressed your view about. Um, you, you've said that it's not about project by, by essence, but that it can become a bad project. Uh, do you think... Um, do you think there's there's too much risk on this ideology that has provoked so much um, war and destruction uh, all around the world on defending it? And there's another topic, it's not related, but you've mentioned Roger Scruton, and he defended that there's nothing more conservative than uh, to um, conserve the, um, uh, our world, or... Um, conserve um, defending the, the fight against climate change because there's a uh, there's a, um, the, it, it is a topic that has been defended always by the left and like the right has never uh, been on this fight uh, what are your views about it well these are excellent uh, questions nationalism or rather so many misdeeds were uh, carried out in the name of nationalism, that one ha hesitates to identify oneself as a nationalist. And I am not a nationalist. I'm a national liberal, because I believe that uh, liberty comes first, and if you want to, you can move to, from your country and choose some other country. And uh, I would like to remind you what Burke said. If we are to love our country, our country has to be lovely. It has to deserve to be loved. And uh, I, I believe that the exit option is excellent to, uh, to uh, control rulers so that if they, for example, overtax us, then we can move somewhere else. Therefore, I am for tax competition, for example. But what, uh, what, what caused the excesses of nationalism in the 20th century? I think it was the abandonment of uh, free trade. If you, uh, in, in Bismarck, Germany, and in many other countries, uh, if you see in your neighbor a potential customer, your propensity to shoot at him will be reduced. Or, uh, to quote uh, Samuel Johnson, a man is seldomly so innocently uh, employed as in making money. Because if you want to make money, you have to uh, satisfy the needs uh, of other people. The baker, uh, he, he, he has to bake... Uh, bread of good quality. The restaurant owner, he uh, has to sell uh, uh, access to his restaurant. Uh, 
I can tell you a little story from uh, South Africa when I was there in 1987. I was on a safari and it was a wonderful time. Uh, apartheid was then still um, on uh, and uh, there was a girl who drove me around in Pretoria <clears throat> and we passed a cinema and I asked her uh, how is it here in uh, South, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, are the cinemas uh, open to all races, all colors? And she said, yes, now, because uh, the cinema owners a few months ago went on strike uh, because they, they did uh, want to uh, have them open for everybody. Now, the very interesting question is, did the cinema owners do this because they were very good people or because they wanted more customers? And I believe that that is uh, what capitalism does. It civilizes us. It... Um, makes us um, um, free trade, makes us in some ways better persons, be better servants of, of, of other people. So that's what I would say about nationalism. Uh, national liberalism, which um, is based on the free market, will not be as dangerous as uh, national socialism, which was a terrible, evil uh, idea. Now, uh, climate change is uh, interesting, and uh, I've said... Well, I, even if I've got a, a, a defil, uh, it is not, not at all in anything um, in, in the natural sciences. I cannot be, uh, by any stretch of imagination, be called an expert on climate change. But I've tried to read up on it, and uh, my conclusions have been two. One is this. It cannot be that somehow, in a mysterious way, we have now reached uh, an era where natural change is uh, not negligible. I think nature must uh, bring about most of the changes of cl climate as it has done in the past. In my own country, Iceland, uh, we discovered America in the year 1000, although Oscar Wilde uh, pointed out that we had a good sense to lose it again. Um, and we uh, actually settled Greenland but the cold spell uh, in uh, the Little Ice Age um, <coughs> extinguished the uh, settlement there. Uh, but the point is this. There was a warm period uh, when we discovered America and settled Greenland. There are warm and cold periods. This does not mean that some of the warming up that we have seen uh, cannot be man-made. It can quite uh, easily be so, and I take the same position on this. Uh, as two men do that, I trust uh, <coughs> uh, Matt Ridley is, is one of them. He, he, is, uh, he is very sensible. Uh, I'm not going to go further into that, but um, uh, the other observation uh, I would make about uh, climate change is, did we, in the years 1980 to 1990, which are the uh, reference points, somehow mysteriously have the optimal climate uh, of all possible climates so that all changes uh, would be for the worse. Uh, we may have a change of one degree down or one degree up. I think the jury is still out on whether it is good, a good or bad thing. We don't really know. So, so what is the sensible thing to do about climate change? I think it is actually to uh, adjust when the problem presents itself and not to believe in uh, doomsday pre pre predictions. Take all of them very, very carefully and cautiously because uh, climate change has actually become rather an industry um, for getting grants from governments than a, a, a real science. So thank you very much. Um, you talk about the devil and how our modern society, or, or since the, the World War II, uh, the, the figure of the devil has been like... I think, can you remove your mask, because I find it a bit difficult. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Better, no? So the figure of the devil has been like uh, omitted, and, at the, and the, the existence of uh, evil things, no? And how can... 
what are you, what's your um, mm, opinion or your uh, what do you think about uh, and how can we um, what's the best way to I don't know to talk about evil things in this society that is really reluctant reluctant to to this idea. I think uh, I think that actually. Uh, both Pedro Schwartz and uh, Professor Contreras, they pointed out that there are uh, civilizing influences, and I would, uh, I would sum them up in three wo words, family, property, and morality. Family uh, extends our uh, time horizon because we are uh, concerned about the future uh, that our children will face. Uh, property does the same uh, because we can plant a tree and uh, reap the fruits of the tree in 10 years time and if we choose to sell it and we can sell it at a higher price if we have planted it. Uh, I think St. Thomas Aquinas was particularly good on this. He has a very cogent uh, defense of private property rights in uh, Summa Theologica. And morality, uh, virtues, noble deeds, and, and so on, they will constrain us. So these are the three things. And they are terribly old-fashioned. Family, property, and morality. But that's the point. That's why I am a conservative liberal, that I just hold old-fashioned values that have uh, proved to be quite conducive to human welfare and progress and uh, individual flourishing in the last 2,000 years. So I cannot really give a more definite answer. Okay, thank you, Hannes. Oh, okay. If I may, one more. Uh, so previously you mentioned that uh, liberty comes first and uh, you have the right and it's, it's, gr it's a great thing that you can choose uh, the country you want to live in. Uh, so it's kind of an exit if you don't, don't like your own country. Uh, but do you think it's applicable uh, for every situation uh, today? And now I'm thinking about uh, one of the most uh, hot potato uh, topic, uh, the mass migration crisis, which Europe had to face uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, and, the, and I guess the main debate is about uh, uh, whether it's a human right uh, to choose the country you want to live in, but in this uh, particular situation, uh, the mass migration coming from Africa, the Middle East, uh, to Europe, do you think it's applicable? I, I think this is also a very good question, and uh, my uh, mentor Hayek discusses it in uh, the constitutional liberty, and there he, um, he argued for the classical liberal uh, principle, uh, which is free movement of uh, capital, goods and uh, people uh, across borders. And uh, the argument is uh, qu quite uh, good, and uh, uh, there was actually, it's usually misquoted as Bastia, but it was somebody else who <coughs> said that if goods are not allowed to cross borders, then uh, soldiers will. You know, and that's another way of putting the case for free trade. Uh, but uh, our society uh, has to be a home, not a prison, but that doesn't mean that we are obliged to let everybody into our home. Uh, I, I'm for free immigration, but we have to realize that uh, there are two conditions. One is that uh, the people who come to our countries, they do not upset uh, our traditions and uh, morality and uh, the all the um, accomplishments of thousands of years that, uh, that we cherish, like our national values. And uh, secondly, they shouldn't be a, a cost, a burden on us. And uh, I would like to point out that one reason why mass immigration may be uh, not necessarily uh, supported by uh, free market arguments is that um, mass immigration and the welfare state don't go very well together. Is it really so that somebody who comes from uh, Africa should just be able to get, a, or get the welfare benefits that we have worked very hard to uh, achieve and we have developed uh, society and the state as a mutual insurance uh, company? Because I, th I think 
uh, that the state is not only the night watchman, it's also an, an insurance broker that uh, provides us with insurance and lays a safety net all around society. And thirdly, uh, the state should be the protector of traditional values, of the flag, of national symbols, and of all kinds of things that we do not want to have corrupted. Uh, I come from a country with a very strong national identity, and so do you. You come from Hungary, as I, if I understand correctly. And these are countries that uh, date back thousands of years, and we have got languages that nobody else understands, so we can speak in secret code when we are in uh, lifts, <laughs> because, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and so on, and there is something very valuable in it, uh, although I also said that uh, we should be able to leave our country. But there is, uh, there is one great, uh, great difference between the Mexican immigration into the United States, or the Central American one, and the North African or Muslim in immigration into Europe, it is that uh, the people who go to um, uh, the United States are going there to work, to escape poverty. Uh, they are not going there to pick up uh, any welfare benefits. And certainly they are not going there to impose upon the Americans all kinds of alien values. But the problem with some of the Muslims, and we, we cannot indict all of them, there is one billion Muslims in the world, and of course they are, most of them are, are as good people as others are. And uh, I, I remind you once again that the father of conservative liberalism, uh, Edmund Burke, said, I know of no method to indict the whole uh, nation. And I know of no method of indicting all Muslims. But there is uh, some Islamic fundamentalism which is threatening the social fabric of the West. And we mustn't let this happen. So I believe that uh, there are uh, cases for uh, stricter immigration controls and uh, stricter demands on the immigrants. For example, uh, I don't want to extend it too much, uh, but uh, the Swiss, there was a Swiss judge uh, who was uh, to swear in uh, new citizens, and they were a couple, uh, a Muslim couple. And then uh, the uh, woman, she refused to shake his hand, this was of course before the pandemic. She didn't get the citizenship. You shouldn't allow people to become citizens if they do not accept all kinds of... Uh, both written and unwritten rules in your societies. And I, oppo I abhor the uh, oppression of women in many Muslim countries. I think men and women, rich and poor, black and white, they should all be equal before the law, just as much as the Bible tells us that they uh, are equal in the eyes of God. Thanks. Are there any other questions? I think everybody is eager to uh, uh, take a look at El Escorial and, uh, um, All and right. rest. So, so thank you very much, Hans. Pleasure is mine.